it is my sincere pleasure to bring up to the stage Robert Lightfoot, Jr. Mr. Lightfoot is NASA's acting administrator, a role he added January 20th in addition to his permanent position for the last five years as NASA's associate administrator, the agency's highest ranking civil servant position. Acting Administrator Lightfoot is an actual rocket scientist. He began his NASA career 29 years ago as a space shuttle main engine test engineer at Marshall Space Flight Center and later at Stennis Space Center. Following the loss of Columbia, he spent two years at NASA headquarters for return to flight activities and initial transition and retirement for space shuttle infrastructure. In addition to being recognized for his leadership three times as a presidential rank award honoree, he also received the Silver Snoopy Award given personally by the astronaut office to those who have enhanced flight safety and mission success. Please join me in welcoming Acting Administrator Mr. Robert Lightfoot Jr. to the stage. Testing. Oh, there we go. All right, we're live now. Uh, big room here, so I'm gonna. I'm not gonna get behind the podium. I'm better pacing and walking around and doing this. First of all, thanks for having me, and, and congratulations to each one of you. Um, this is this is a a, a, a career-defining award for you guys. You guys are the best of the best in federal service, and I thank you for what you do. Um, being the acting administrator for the last 11 months, I thank you even more for what you do. Uh, <laughs> In terms, of, in terms of keeping this federal government running and, and, and the efforts it takes from each one of you to do that. And I think, you know, we, we, we are, in my opinion, the career guys, we are the folks that, that keep this place running, keep the trains on the tracks and, and actually provide the strategic guidance to the folks that are coming in behind us um, on, the, on the political side to make sure that they, they understand the implications of a lot of things. Sometimes we're successful, sometimes we're not. Um, but that's what we get to do and that's our charge going forward. I thought what I would do is uh, take a little time to, to kind of walk through something we do at the agency. Um, I want to share kind of my leadership tenets. I am going to guess that most of these are not going to be earth shattering to you because you're in this room today. Um, however, if I share them with you a little bit, maybe you'll, catch, you'll glean a few nuggets out of this that you can take back and maybe use in your own leadership journey. Because that's what leadership is, it is a journey. It's just not, you don't get, if you think you've got leadership nailed, you're wrong. There's more to learn. I do something with inside the agency and with several companies called Lightfoot on Leadership and it's LOL on purpose, right? Because it's supposed to be laugh out loud. Because, because anytime you think you got this figured out, something else pops up that you, can, that you can learn from and actually continue to grow. That Lightfoot on Leadership, I started in about 2007. I'm on revision 23 of the presentation that I do. So you're not going to get the whole presentation because y'all don't have enough time and, and uh, you would be bored. For the NASA folks that are here, raise your hand so I, I can All right, so you guys are tired of this. I apologize. You will hear it again. Um, so you can just, you know, get your, get your iPhones out, check your email. Um, and you're also not allowed to tell people, he doesn't really do that. Right? <laughs> That's just not true. Um, I, I do, what I talk about in here, the leadership tenets I think are very important for senior leaders, especially in the federal service, but really anywhere. And I think what I want you guys to think about is, when I talk about them, I do not have these nailed, right? But these are the things I'm working on and they're most important to me as a leader uh, of the best place to work in government for six years in a row. So anyway, not that, I, not that we count. Um, <clears throat> so we just got that announcement last week, so I'm pretty excited about that going forward. So again, I think you think you'll find some things. And, and let's talk a little bit first about the environment that we're all living in, right? Um, you're sitting here today on Thursday, December 7th, hoping you come to work tomorrow. Right? I, I just left a meeting that said it's going to be okay. How many times have we heard that? All right. So, but it, does, but it does create a set of inefficiencies that we all deal with on a daily basis. That we all, that, that I, I, we, had a, we had a new person come in to the agency recently and uh, we were having a conversation about shutdown. And it was just our little senior management team and it was fascinating because we were, me and the, I'm, I'm actually the COO, the associate administrator, which means nothing to anybody. I'm really the COO. Um, the CO, CFO and I were having this conversation. Okay, we had all the, everything's in place. We're doing this. To, just matter of fact, 
you know, kind of clipping it off because we've all gotten so used to running the exercise. You guys all know it. And the new person goes, what are we doing? Could this really happen? And I went, it probably won't happen, but we have to go through the exercise and the process. So we all dust those, those infamous plans off and go through it. But that's an environment you operate in. And as a leader, that is freaking hard. It is really hard to operate in that environment on a, on a daily basis. You also deal with several tyrannies, as I call them. I have this thing that I call the tyrannies of leadership. And, and the first one is the tyranny of or versus the power of and. Everybody wants to make you make a decision, this or that. Right? This is, how, this is how you live. This is what you live with. I just encourage every one of you, when somebody does that to you, just immediately change it. How about this and that? Right? Milk or cookies or milk and cookies? So you can, you can change the dynamic of a conversation just by making that one simple change right, with your leadership team because everybody's going to force you in that. The next thing they do is the tyranny of the urgent. Every one of you is dealing with the tyranny of the urgent every day. And what I do, I'm, I'm from Alabama, um, and, and what I do when people come in needing a decision that's urgent, um, I typically go Alabama on them pretty quick. Because, and that means I get really slow, and I go to my roots and go back and say, hey, okay, so explain this to me. Because usually urgent, and, and all decisions that, you know, aren't always urgent, right? And we have, I have a statement that me and Bill Gerstenmeier, who runs the human exploration program for NASA, we, I, I, I talk about don't, don't cross a bridge you hadn't come to yet. That's called a cliff, right? <laughs> so so just, just be really careful that people aren't making you do that. The other, the other thing we, we all deal with, and it's just, it's just the environment we're in, is TMI, the tyranny of TMI, too much information, right? The old days when I was getting trained, you got this, you know, I guess it was about a, you were trained about the 90 second elevator speech, tell everybody what you can do in 90 seconds. Now you get, tell everybody what you can do in a 90 megabyte file that they send to you, right? And you're supposed to go through it. And so I've started sending stuff back. Tell me what in here is important. I don't have time to read your 90 page PowerPoint presentation to understand what's going on. So that's something, that's the environment you're in. It's absolutely the environment you're in going forward. We talk a lot about natural born leaders or they, or leaders born or grown. And I, and I have a quote that, that, that I have used for a long time that I think is kind of nails it for me, right? By the way, if you, I, I have nothing original here. These are things I've stolen from people. Um, <laughs> they, but if I use the quote, it's applicable to me. I at least like the quote from that perspective. And it's, it's the following, it's Elaine Agatha. Leaders are born with only one thing they need, a backbone, right? They must grow a wishbone and a funny bone so that you've got the vision and the sense of humor. You've got to have something like that in the world we're in. And, I, and I've always thought about that, about whether people are, are grown. The other thing that we deal with a lot as federal employees and senior executives over federal employees is we deal with the, the critics. A lot of critics out there, a lot of people want to tell us anything. And, and any of you that my favorite quote of all time is The Man in the Arena by Teddy Roosevelt. And so most of you have heard it, I'm sure. You wouldn't be sitting in this room if you didn't it, have, haven't heard it, or you've lived it, okay, which is even better. So I, I always take the opportunity to read the whole thing so that people can hear it. And I'm going to read it so you can hear it. It's not the critic that counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles, or where the doer of good deeds could have done better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcomings, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end of the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly. So that his place shall never be with those cold, timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. That's what you guys do every day, right? I have this on my wall. We have a couple of blogs that like to talk about NASA. And when I get those blogs in that tell us how bad we are, I read that. And I'm reminded of those people that, that get on us occasionally. They don't, they're not in the arena. They're not fighting the battle. You guys are fighting the battle every day. So thank you for that. Thank you for what you do from that perspective. I think the other thing that, that I'll share with you is I bring every one of our senior executives that get into NASA. We have, we have roughly 400 at any given time at NASA. I onboard every one of them personally. Would they come in and we, ha we, have, a, we have a conversation about my, expected, my expectations of them and what they do. I'm going to share those with you. 
These will not be new to you, again, not earth shattering, but I'm going to share with you why I think they're important to try to set the bit with the new SESers. In the old days, about four or five years ago, before I started doing this, we used to say, congratulations, go forth, see you later, right? You're on your own. You made the SES, we're not going to help you anymore. Now we try to help folks and try to get them ready. Try to use that probationary period to actually have them go meet with other leaders and get to know people as they go forward. I think it's important. So the first thing we talk about is that when, when you look at your, you guys all do the SES performance system. It's the fun, fun, fun that we get to do. In the old days at NASA, results driven drove the, drove the whole thing. And about five years ago, we flipped it to where behaviors, the first four things which define your behaviors are what matter. So at NASA, if you come to NASA, 60% of your grade is based on behaviors and only 40 is on results. It used to be the other way around. So you could, you could deliver the best mission in the world and leave a bunch of dead bodies in the wake and you'd get a five, right? And we said, no more. Part of your job as leadership is, is the behaviors. So results are necessary, but they're just not sufficient is what we're really trying to say as we move forward. So we do that. We also try to explain to these senior executives, and you guys know this well, you're in a fishbowl, right? You're now at the table, right? And you need to just, and it's all about behaviors. You need to just, uh, uh, show the kind of behaviors that you want, that you want to, people to mock. Or you want them to mimic it. You want the people on the wall where we used to be. And we go, oh boy, look at that. How'd you get away with that? How'd she get away with that? Right? Either way, you're in that fishbowl. And every once in a while at the senior executive level, even though you all represent a very myopic or, or, or parochial part of your given agency or department, you got to put the big hat on. you got to put the agency hat on. And that's really hard. Because sometimes the decisions are going to be brought to you that affect you, but they're better for the whole agency. And, and my best leaders are the ones that can actually see past their own, their own organization and, and be effective and help me make the right decisions going forward. So that's important for folks to do that. Leadership tenets that I share that I think are very important and applicable to each one of us as we go through this. It's all about our people, period, period. You take care of your people, they'll take care of you. Those are all trite statements, but it's actually true. I've watched it happen many, many times. And I think for us at NASA, what we try to do is we focus on the people because the people get the mission done. They're so mission focused, they'll get it done for us if we can take care of them, and that's our job. And I, and I talk about the fact that, that you're part of those people. We're not separated as senior executives. We're part of that team too, that E.M. Kelly. Remember the difference between a boss and a leader. The boss says go, and the leader says let's go. We're with them when we do this. So remember that when you're thinking. The other thing you gotta have is you gotta have a passion to lead. And I don't want you to confuse the passion of, for leadership with the passion for mission. They aren't the same. I have people like, I think, I don't know if he's here, but Kirk Sharman, right? I think he, he's speaking later. He's at the International Space Station Program Manager, one of the best leaders we have in the agency. That man has a tremendous amount of passion for the International Space Station. But he also has a tremendous amount of passion in terms of developing and leading people, right? When you take one of these jobs, you take a new job. The mission is important, but you have to have that passion to, to lead and go forward. You've got to develop folks, right? You've got to get to the point where you value and really promote diversity and inclusion from a perspective of including everyone. Diversity and inclusion is, is, yes, it's about race, gender, and ethnicity. That's a critical part of it. But it's also about making sure you're including everybody. Every one of us has a mental Rolodex. And that mental Rolodex drives the way we think on a daily basis. I used to have a deputy. She just retired probably because I did this all the time. If I had a problem, that problem equaled Lisa. Right? And Lisa, I would go, Lisa, get it. Right? And because what would happen is I didn't have to think anymore because I knew Lisa would handle it. But every once in a while, Lisa would have to go, Uncle, what about other people? And I would go, Oh, I might have to talk to them. I might actually have to kind of give them some coaching and mentoring. Oh, I don't have enough time already. Can't you just do it? I mean, that's the challenge for us each. We all have that mental Rolodex. These problems equal these people. And how do we include the other people that we have in our agencies? and let them get those opportunities. That's leading people. That's the part that's the passion to lead. I used to do, a, we used to do an activity when I was the center director at Marshall Space Flight Center down in Huntsville. I would bring my senior team together and I had different ways to articulate this discussion. Now, down in Huntsville, Alabama, really anywhere in Alabama, you have to declare pretty early, are you Alabama or Auburn? That's the way it works, right? <laughs> it's, just, it's just part of the culture. Now, I, I'm a Bama grad, so, uh, you know, we would get up there and we would have these. So what I would do is I'd take my senior team and I'd say, if you're Alabama or Auburn, get over there. If you're somebody else, get over here. 
And so we'd all trickle over to this side of the room and we'd kind of joke, oh, yeah, we're gonna, all the stuff that we always do, right? And I looked across and I said, these people over here, they hate us, right? <laughs> they are so tired of us talking about football 365 days a year, right? And that's, and that's what happens. We are unintentionally excluding these folks, right? And they're over there going like this. And then one of my favorites goes, I can't help it if they went to the wrong school, right? <laughs> And I went, you just made my point. Thank you so much. And then I took the same group and I said, if you were the first person to graduate from college in your family, that side of the room, everybody else on the other side of the room, four people out of about 40. And everybody on the other side of the room went, wow, those are kind of like our hardest workers. They're also independent, stubborn, right? And sometimes not quite as polished as some of the others because they didn't have the role models that some people had but critical members of our team. And then you think about what they did to get into those positions versus we did, what, we, what we may have done. It becomes a powerful display of the diversity that they bring to the table when they come in there. So just ways to think about that and to kind of break your mental model. I think the other thing you have to do as a leader is you have to listen. I use the phrase listen without the intent of responding, um, which I learned from somebody once in a, we're, we're, we're sitting in a, teleconference and this one guy's got his finger on the mute button just waiting for the guy on the other end to take a breath so he can so he can tell him how stupid he is right and and another guy grabs him by the belt and gently pulls him back in his chair would you please listen without the antenna responding you might hear something because he was so focused on replying to like the first sentence the guy said so I think that's that's important there's a there's a great quote wisdom is the reward you get for a lifetime of listening when you would have preferred to talk <laughs> right and that's how you become wise the other thing about if you're not listening, you can, you can get in trouble. My wife, about two years into our marriage, she sat me down one day. She says, I need to talk to you, but I don't need you to fix anything. And I went, what are you talking about? She goes, as soon as I start talking, you start fixing. And I went, well, that's not true. Anyway, so, so, so as I listened to her, and I listened to her go through this, this, this whole thing, it was funny what I heard because I was not trying to fix and you heard a totally different thing. And the other thing from an employee perspective, if you're always fixing things, who works for who? <laughs> right? So this is where you learn one of the most important things I think we have to learn as senior executives is you have, in this positions we're in, we have to ask the right questions. We don't have to have the answers. Our teams have the answers if we'll ask the right questions. Right? And we'll pull it out of them. And you can't walk into a meeting, this is my biggest flaw, biggest weakness, and the NASA guys know this too well. I'll walk in there and go, hey, we got this issue, this is what I think we should do, what do y'all think? Right? It's amazing how many people go, oh, you're right, Robert. Right? <laughs> you're right, you got it. Anyway, so, so that's just something to think about, right? We learn to lead with questions, not answers, and I think as long as you take the time to do that, you'll, you'll, you'll be okay. Uh, I think the other thing you gotta have is a, is an, is a positive attitude, right? And when I, think about a, when I think about attitude and talk about positive attitude, I use the phrase reality-based optimism, okay? Because I don't need sunshine and rainbows. I didn't do anything for me either. That's, two, that's those people that, oh, everything's great. Sometimes it's not great. And it's okay to say it's not great. But I don't need Eeyore either, right? The Eeyores of the world drive me crazy too. So both ends of that spectrum are not good. But if you can provide reality-based optimism for your team, I've been through th three major changes in program at, programs in NASA where we had to lease you know, six, 7,000 people walk out the door, right? You gotta some, how do you work through that? And it's, by the way, it's easy to lead, very easy to lead when things are going well. It's, it's a little bit more complex when things are not so, not so hot. So just think about that for, you get to set that attitude. Nobody drives your attitude but you. I don't care how bad I treat you, how bad somebody treats you, how you respond is all yours. And I think you can tell your teams that to work that. You have to set the example. I used to work at a place called Stennis Space Center one of the largest geographical centers we have. And my office happened to be by the front, as I ran a test area, so all the test stands were here, my office was here, my office was right by the front door, you had to come through there to go to the parking lot. Now, I wasn't even paying attention to all that until this happened. So I had to leave early one day, I was working usually seven to 5.30 or six, just because I had stuff to do. The guys in the back were running tests, their, their normal hours were seven to 3.30. I had to leave, I left at three, to go get a haircut of all things. Realized about halfway across the site, I'd left my badge. Go back to get my badge, and then I come back to get my badge, there's this line of cars. And I go, that's everybody on my team. 
And they're all sheepishly going, you know, <laughs> they're kind of looking down, uh, don't see Robert. But what I found, so I, so I called the team together the next day. I, took, I called my, my branch chiefs in the next day and said, what's going on here? And they said, well, people won't leave until you leave. Right? And you're by the front door. <laughs> they, can't even, they, they can't even sneak out. And so, so I had all hands and I said, gang, you guys, I treat you like professionals. I ask you to stay here to midnight sometimes to run tests. When you're not running tests, it's okay to go home. I'm not paying attention. What I found out was two people before me, the, the person that ran the area would go out and fill hoods of cars to see if people had come in late or not. Now, how about that for a culture? <laughs> not the culture we want to do. The other thing I think you have to have is I think you have to have a sense of humor. I think a sense of humor is really important. And when I say a sense of humor, I mean about yourself, not others. Don't do that. That's never good. <laughs> never good. If you think you're being funny, somebody in the room doesn't, right? And, and you have to, and what I mean by that is you, my, my sense of humor is what it is, right? About myself. And, and you've got to be able to laugh at yourself. When we, when we take our jobs too seriously, we get in trouble. And that's what happens. I, or not, I'm sorry, when we take ourselves too seriously, we get in trouble. I want everybody to take their job extremely seriously, <laughs> right? But I don't want them to take themselves so seriously. There was somebody there before them, there'll be somebody there after us every time, right? But I get people that are wound up tight. I'm like, y'all need to relax, right? <laughs> it's gonna be okay. And you, if you can walk in and do things, we, we had a, we had a, this, this, when this big thing happened with the 6,000 folks that we had, we knew we were gonna have to walk out the door. I walk in, it was a president's budget that had gotten dropped and it was one of those exciting times like several of you I'm sure have experienced where you kind of go, oh, this is gonna be awful. Um, and you, you, we walk in and I mean, it's just chatter and noise, everybody's loud and I go sit down. As soon as I sit down, everybody gets really quiet, sits down and just all eyes on me, right? And it happened to be the conference room we're in, there's a window behind where I sit. And I went, what? Right? Just to try to get people to relax, right? <laughs> what are you looking at? But, but we don't have the answers sometimes, right? And as leaders, we've got we to gotta admit that. It's okay to say, I don't know, but we're going to work through it. That's what we do as a team. And I think, again, people, people tend to take things a little too serious at times. The last thing that I'll, that I'll share with you, and this has become for me personally, as an, as an engineer somewhere deep down inside, I was an engineer when she said, I'm a rocket scientist. I used to be. I'm a bureaucrat now, man. You, you ask me to do any rocket science, I'm gonna fire you because you don't need to be talking to me about that anymore. But, but you have to learn to control your emotions. And, and when I moved up here five years ago from, from the field centers, um, you know, this is a lot, this, is, this town can be logic free at times. And, and uh, I have to be careful, I see a camera over there. This might be my, this might be my last speech. Uh, but you, but you can. I mean, there's things that happen that just don't make sense, right? And they, and they tend to, they tend to uh, annoy me at times. And um, so, what you have to do, though, you got to control those emotions. Now, notice I didn't say don't have emotions. What I want you to think about is controlling them, right? And control them and, and using them in a constructive way. I've been known. I, we all do three. I hope you all do 360s and stuff like that occasionally to check on your stuff. Since about 1998, when I did my first one, I still have. Robert has episodes. He spews, right? <laughs> it happens. I'm sorry. You know, I'm trying to work on it. And I've gotten better. Um, but trying not to do that and trying to demonstrate, like I said, back to it's about behaviors. Is that the kind of behavior that we want to have, that we want to show? No, it's not, right? But it's also, we're also human, right? You can't, sometimes it's going to happen. Best thing to do is just apologize, you know, and, and move on but try to control the emotions and have them in a way that you want to demonstrate behaviors that are going to be more effective for you as a team. So that's kind of what I bring when I bring our new SESers in. I do it for therapy for me as much as anything because everything I just read you reminds me of what I think is important. And I encourage you guys to do that. Think about that as you, in your leadership journey. What makes you tick? It's a lot harder to write it down than you think. Um, I thought it would be really easy to go, oh yeah, I know what leadership is, rip them off. Very easy, right? But that's, it's just hard. So I congratulate each one of you again for what you've done and the honor that you're receiving. I know it's well-deserved because I know how the process is and I know, I know how hard it is to, to, to get through this. I call it the hourglass, right? You, you finally get that sand that makes it through and you're getting recognized for, for tremendous work. Public service, I mean, I'm in this business just like you guys are. It's not appreciated nearly as much as it should be. 
and what you guys do every day is great. And I'm going to share a quote with you to close it out here that's really important to me. It's one that I, it's one that I believe in. Again, you don't have to believe anything I said, by the way. This is just my ideas. But, but this is one that comes from Major General Perry Smith. He's, he did uh, Desert Storm. or Well, he actually was on CNN during Desert Storm back in 91 and 92. He wrote a book called Rules and Tools for Leaders. And as an engineer, it's probably the most process-based book I've ever read. There's a checklist at the end of every chapter. It's great. You can just, you know, <laughs> sure, if I do all this, I'll be great. Anyway, but there's a quote in there that, that I think really defines what each one of you are doing every day. And what each one of you should be proud of what you're doing. And I thank you personally for what your, your contribution. Leadership is serving your people, serving the mission, giving power away, and raising the level of dignity and integrity in your organization. There is no activity in the human endeavor that is more fascinating, more challenging, and more rewarding than leading an organization with an important mission. At NASA, I feel like we have a hell of an important mission and my teams love what they do. As a federal service, we have an incredibly important mission that we all execute on a daily basis. Thank you for what you do and thanks for listening to me. Have fun the rest of the day. Thank you, Administrator Lightfoot. Um, so I think we now know the answer to the question. What's the question? What's the question? Does it take a rocket scientist to get you uh, first place in the FEV scores on an annual basis? And Thank you all. Was that fantastic or what? So before we get to our recognition ceremony, um, I'd like to recognize and thank our lunch table sponsor, the Arbinger Institute. Uh, where are you guys? Yeah, stand up, stand up. <laughs> Woo <-hoo. laughs> uh, and then our small business sponsors, uh, Pivotal Practices <laughs> and the Federal Employee Defense Services. Uh, again, please stand up and thank you so much for what you do. And then uh, we have a long list of community sponsors. And by community sponsors, these are groups, uh, associations, you know, that we work with, we, the Senior Executives Association, to put this summit together. And they're our partners. They range from the National Academy of Public Administration to American University's key leadership program to the Federal Managers Association. I'm not going to read off the list, uh, but it's in your brochure. These are the people who really helped make this summit possible. Thank you so much. Now we're going to take just a couple minute break to set up for the recognition ceremony and we'll be right back with you. Enjoy your coffee. <laughs>